hands on you. Come put your shoulders to the wheel and paddle your own canoe. Hooray then for the ship canal, three cheers me boys for you. Look up your Austin implements, there's lots of work in view. Then love your neighbour as yourself, will sing while sailing through. The ship canal to Manchester on board our ocean screw. I must have been about, I should say, between between nine and ten, because I remember them fetching a silver barrel, and there were four gentlemen, and they cut something off the, out of the ground and put it in this barrel. That was when they first cut the sod, as far as I remember. It started in uh, 1887, and it finished in 1893. It took six years to build it. Well, I was born in 79, 1879, and uh, I just want to give you my little career as regards ship canal. I started when I was uh, 12, but I started on the false pretenses. They said I hadn't to start without I was 14, and I run home and told my old mother that I could have a job in the morning if I was 14. She says, well, you shall have your brother's certificate. He was two years older than me. So I started on the false pretenses. And the, the wages then was twopence farther than an hour. Ten and fourpence for a week of 56 hours. I was born there in 1876. That's my own. I worked on the canal from when I was 13 at various jobs. Wagging, greeting, point turning, nippering for gangs and all that. I went down there and asked him his name was Tom Wiltshire for a job. Yes, he said. I'll give you a job, lad. He said you can go into the cripple yard there. He said, greet them wagons after they've finished them. I said, all right. So I went there. I was fat in wagons all the time. I'd say for 18 months or two years. We had a, a box of wagon grease. I always remember when I started, the boss told me, he says, go to the joiner shop and tell him you want a fat box. Well, they made us a, a square box, I'd just say about nine inches square with a handle on it, and we had to go to a barrel of grease, fill that box up, and then we had what they call a fat stick, a bit of wood improvised out so we could dive in and we had to crawl underneath. There was no axle boxes outside like there are on the wagons today. There was all, you had to get underneath and plaster it in under the pedestals. And you crawling about in sludge or anything, that was part in wagon. There was every county in England represented on the canal. Every county in Scotland, every county in Ireland, but there were very few Welshmen. I don't remember only one Welshman on the job, and a Cornishman, Cornish Jimmy. Oh, we had hundreds of Irishmen on the canal. Yes. Bad workers and all. Oh, they had to work or else get out. Oh, with plenty of Irishmen from one end to the other. There wasn't like our people. <laughs> There was, no, honestly speaking, there was more sedate. You never hear them swear once in the blue moon. No. Our book is kind of open. <laughs> oh, no, there was, there was good, the good hard-working man, there's no doubt about it. Well, my navy ganger, I was fighting for this gang. He died, I think he had about seven Irishmen out of his ten in the gang because they'd work harder than the Englishman. They're all robust and all and strong as bloody lions. A lot of people uh, have the impression that all the work was done with pick, spade and barrow. Well, that is not true because even in those days they had what was then modern plant. There were the German Lubecker land dredger. There was also a French model, 
But the bulk of the work was carried out, of course, by the labour. There were well over 16,000 men and boys employed on digging the canal. There was a mighty lot done by hand, what they call graft, Barra roads and uh, these chaps, these from Lincoln, there used to be perhaps a gang of them, about 13 or 14 of them. They used to take a job piecework, you know. And they used to do it all by hand till eventually, anywhere where they could get one of those excavators, well, they'd have one. But there was places where they couldn't get them. But uh, it was wonderful. Yes, pick and shovel and with what they call good money, but not much of it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now, as regards the young fillers, they were different prices, they were piecework. Some they got one and eightpence a wagon, some they got one and tenpence. But if it was bad stuff and wet, they got a half a crown. And there was four gangs doing that at the back end. Charlie Prattley, Lady Killing Ginger. <laughs> there was one gang there, they were Lincolnshire chaps in Cambridge and Norfolk. They didn't have a ganger. They were a leading man. They were great, big, powerful fellas. And these bill boys always loaded up a nine gallon barrel of beer and paid for it in their turn. They say, the boys, come on, we'll have a hole of ale. And they used to drink it out of a cow's hole with the bottom in. That's what they had. And they were men. I said they were men. They were as strong as elephants. And there was one man who worked there. He was a tall fellow with a sandy beard. He used to call him Salvation Harry. He was a Salvation man. He was the best spade man ever I saw in my life, either before or since. He was automation. Well, uh, there was uh, men that uh, always could say they could put that much on a barrier, you know, they used to brag. There was Lincolnshire men that it was impossible to wheel it away without the handle breaking. And uh, they give them a nickname. They used to always call them Stoutons. Stoutons, I don't know why, but there was a big hefty lot of men, more like farm labourers and all that. If I can picture them now, like in, in them days, roll up of a morning, six o'clock, strip off, and perhaps uh, some of them are down fire a little bit, like about pulling enough off and the uh, Gang a man had said to him, now oh, then, my lad, what are you going to do? Are you going to let the sun burn that jacket off? You know, take it off without a murmur, you know. Uh, that's as near slavery as we can go back to, you know. They had to do what they were told. They do what they like today, don't they? Yes. Yes. They drank a belly. They swore heavily, and they live up. This song to the earth, they were men. You haven't got them now. We had to work. It's never been done since. We mustn't have done me any harm, else I wouldn't have been here. I'm nearly 92. A few more months, I'll be 92. Ah, oh, they never, never let the old Navi in a thousand years. No, the old Navi had do two days while they was thinking of one. No, and they never stopped. They used to be what we call blind in chain. He said, never stop. The old Navi gang had never bother them. Well, Hard work, bitter beer, that's why I'm living today. <laughs> because I never ate much food, and yet I'm as strong as a lion now. Can't get a job. 
I'll be uh, 90 in a couple of months. Because it's a privilege. I've seen can't get a job. <laughs> That's Mr. Beer for you. Yes, well, it's true. Tough they may have been, but this didn't stop a great many being injured, or worse. Unfortunately, like other schemes, there was loss of life on the construction. Uh, with a very high accident rate, this was anticipated by the chief engineer. Uh, that is why he was instrumental in getting Mr. Robert Jones as a surgeon in charge of the accident and indeed medical service for the construction years. Oh, yes. There were a lot of people killed, a lot of people injured and then maimed for life. There was a man cut in two, a little bit farther up there. I think there were 139 people killed during the uh, just over six years that it was being constructed. Yes, yes, and of course it was an organised accident service. Strategically, the placing of the three base hospitals, of the dressing stations, the first aid stations, and of the uh, use of the railway, which ran, the overland railway, as they called it, which ran along the canal, uh, which could bring a seriously injured man with very little delay to a base hospital so that it did not depend on chance. It really was an organized scheme, an organized accident service. And at one time, there was quite a lot of talk in Hong Kong about an accident that happened in Inch Cutting. I think a train fell into the Great Cut and there were indescribable scenes. They had to get them out with the use of steam cranes. And there, probably, there will be a lot of amputations. And a good many of those injured men would not, would not live, would not survive. There's an old gentleman, name of uh, Mr. Antrobus. And he remembers my father's accident. He used to tell me about it. The old men pull the shirts off and all manner of clothing to help to tie him up and get him away to Latchford Hospital. And he said he was a very brave man. The injured man uh, would be picked up by the first aid people, put on a um, stretcher and into um, a truck on the little railway and dispatched to the uh, nearest um, base hospital where there was a medical officer uh, acting under Robert Jones who became pretty skillful in combating shock and giving the immediate first aid uh, until Robert Jones arrived to carry out the major uh, surgical treatment. He was described as a sun man irradiated. I've seen him go around hospitals with men with shattered limbs who really gone through it. A few words, a smile, a little hint. The man, all eyes, looking at this man as if he were a god. Floods and severe winters also delayed the work and increased the cost. Loans from the Manchester City Council enabled the project to continue, and at long last, they let the water in. This house here was flooded. Did you look to that window cell there? They let it in on a Saturday night. All that land over the other side of the canal, right away, up to Runcan Highway, was flooded. All up that lane at the other side there, past that farmhouse. They lifted the sluices that high at Latchford that when they come to try to get them down, the volume of water under the gate 
wouldn't let them. The cattle were standing up to their bellies in water. The three old men who recalled how they worked on the construction of the canal were Charlie Williams of Fallowfield, John Dobson of Moore, and Charles Chambers of Heptonstall.